When a million peasants pick up pitchforks to pillage and plunder your palaces, you know you've screwed up somewhere. And this momentous peasant revolt is exactly what the Mandate of Heaven DLC for Total War Three Kingdoms covers. When in 8184, the poor and downtrodden of China decided to show the corrupt Han Empire exactly who dictates the right to rule. You'll take part in this historic event and decide whether to burn the empire down or to reform it so it can rise again like a phoenix from its ashes. In it, you'll play as either the Yellow Turban Rebels or Loyalists to the Han Empire. And in this video, I'll show you what six factions from the event are playable and throw in a few historical insights for each to show how they translate into gameplay. First off though, the Yellow Turban Rebellion actually kicked off in AD 184, and the game begins in 182, mainly just to give you a few turns to get the feel of the world before everything goes to hell in a handbasket. It also adds a new starting date for other fan favorite factions of the Three Kingdoms as well, and that includes a more aerodynamic Dong Zhuo. The main man stirring up all this trouble is Zhang Jue, a Taoist priest who preached the way of supreme peace but somehow didn't see the irony in burning down local government buildings and murdering Han officials. Sick of seeing the poor and downtrodden of the Han Empire being starved and worked to death, he declared that he had seen a vision of a new yellow sky, one that would replace the current Han Azuruan. And the only way to bring about this new heaven was to fight for it. And it's from this vision that the Yellow Turbans get their name, though they could just as easily have been called the Yellow Scarves, Headbands, or Do-Rags. Regardless, you'll spread the Yellow Rebellion by ransacking settlements and boosting fervor throughout the land, all to free the people from the yoke of Chinese corruption and tyranny. Zhong Jue's two main supporters in this are his blood-born brothers, Zhong Liang and Zhong Bao, both of who are integral to your success in a Yellow Turban campaign, as for the first time, your unique zeal resource is shared and generated jointly between all three Yellow Turban factions so each man must generate it and contribute it back to the brothers. The how of its acquisition is what makes each of their campaigns unique. Zhong Jue builds zeal by causing enemy casualties, hacking loyal Han sympathizers to death, because nothing says Taoist priest like killing as many people as humanly possible. To help you do this, you'll use Zhong Jue's unique Messengers of Heaven melee cavalry and Chosen of the Eight Immortals dual-wielding infantry. Both are designed to cause as much damage as possible, but the trade-off is that they also die rather quickly. But since all Zhang Jue's armies get plus eight morale, everyone will fight to the last man. And even that's not a problem as Zhang Jue was a renowned healer, or diabolical sorcerer depending on your source. And as your zeal increases, he gains huge bonuses to replenishment and additional income from peasantry, so that you're poised to roll over your enemies in a yellow tide, and are never wanting for additional volunteer peasants to go fight your enemies. Your point man in this campaign, though, will be Zhong Bao, who gains zeal by attacking enemies. And not surprisingly, as your zeal rises, he also gets increased damage while attacking, which makes his ferocious zealots of the way polearm infantry even more effective, as cleavers tied to sticks weren't terrifying enough by themselves. And to ensure you can cut through Han loyalists like butter, Zhong Bao also gets Yao Guai hunters literally translated as demons, who have guerrilla deployment and poison attacks, which in Total War is called the I Win combination. The third brother, Zhang Liang, was the fighter of the bunch, which makes it somewhat unfortunate that the General of Beast mode here is a defensive lord, who only gains zeal when defending, and his damage bonuses only apply when he is defending which means you're going to spend a lot of time on the campaign map sitting around in your ass trying to taunt people into attacking you. But at least while they sit there arguing, they will be taking increased attrition damage, as that is his unique ability. And if someone is fool enough to finally take the bait and Red Rover over, they'll be met by the Tyrant Slayer Shock Cavalry and the Gallants of the People Spearmen, which means that when you play as Zhang Liang, you can hammer an anvil until the cows come home, the rooster crows, or whatever Chinese proverb means the same thing. Just know that if you ever find yourself on the back foot, the rebellion will start to crumble around you and your zeal will plummet. So ignore Smokey the Bear and instead burn anything you come across. If it sounds like the Yellow Turbans are poised to put the Han Empire up shit creek, you're right. But interestingly, there was an exception during this time of revolt. The first man on the Han Empire playlist, Liu Chong. 
who, as a powerful warrior and distant relative of the ruling family, was the Prince of Qin. You'll begin the game as a Han Empire subject, but when the rest of China was a sea of yellow chaos, Qin was an island of calm, because Lur Chong figured out that the best way to stop the turbans was to put archers on his borders and feather anyone that looked at them crossways. You'll see this in-game with his Qin Peacekeeper Melee Cavalry and Qin Royal Guard Crossbowmen, who are heavily armored and punch holes in anyone that thinks about the color saffron for too long. Every lord has a unique mechanic of some kind, but Lur Chong is unique to all of Total War. He has a trophy cabinet, which you can fill by completing various quests, like recruit X number of guys or have X number of horses, and then you can equip these for extra buffs and benefits. It's a remix of tech trees and item equipping that I expect we'll see again in future games, though I do hope it's a bit more specific in the future, like kill Lu Bu or win a victory alongside Lu Bei, but even as is, they spice up his campaign. This desire to fight and collect is referenced in Liu Chong's Fortitude resource. It grows by fighting and winning battles, and you get even more of it with lopsided victories, because the object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other poor dumb bastard die for his. And as your fortitude grows, it decreases enemy morale while increasing your own, while also giving extra experience and replenishing your troops. And as you can't spend it on anything, it's a nice meter to judge how big of a badass your Lur Trong is at the moment. And since you'll be playing the Lone Rock in a sea of rebellion, expect it to hit Patton levels when his campaign goes full Battle of the Bulge and you find yourself surrounded by turbans. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you'll find Lur Ji a scholarly Han governor who schooled the likes of Liu Bei and Gong Xunzan. But don't let that fool you. Underneath that warm, school-marm exterior, you'll find the black heart of a ruthless librarian, bent on using books to dominate the world. His faction mechanic is the Great Library, a collection of arcane books used to boost his intellect to better dominate his foes. Where, like Liu Chong, as he achieves a series of civic feats, he unlocks a range of books to populate his library, each with their own bonuses, and as some of them are a set of books, you'll get additional Pokemon bonuses by collecting them all. And see, I told you that mechanic would come up again. Liu Ji headed one of the first armies to be sent north to fight the Turbans, and likely would have been successful too if it hadn't been for Imperial posturing and a bunch of meddling eunuchs that called him back early. Which brings us to the major faction on the map, and the one you really want to hear about, the Han Empire itself, headed by Liu Hong, better known to history as Emperor Ling, who rules over an empire on the verge of collapse. You'll notice that the Han Empire dominates the entire map of China, but don't go thinking it means you'll be controlling it all. In fact, due to Emperor Liu Hong being nearly a puppet at this point, you'll only have one settlement at the start, Luo Yang, under your direct control. The rest of the empire are imperial subjects. And unlike vassals in previous games, this comes with a give and take relationship, where you collect 80% of the taxes of your subjects, but then redistribute 90% of it back out again. So don't expect unlimited income here. Governments very rarely run in the black, after all. The Emperor's court is controlled by corrupt and self-serving eunuchs and bureaucrats, who lash out at anyone who opposes them, and powerful local warlords seek to undermine the Emperor's authority and carve out their own domains. From this, we get Lu Hong's unique faction mechanic, the Imperial Court where three factions vie for control of the government. You begin with the bureaucrats in charge, led by the eunuch faction, and you'll notice right off the bat that leaving them in charge here will run the government into the ground. So as Liu Hong, you'll need to focus on politics in this campaign and work to replace them by spending political influence to remove them from their offices. They can then be replaced with either supporters of the imperial dynasty or warlords. Each of them give their own unique bonuses that focus on either centralizing or disseminating imperial power. And as you loosen your grip on the warlords and give them more power, you'll gain the ability to coordinate your war efforts and sick them on anyone who opposes you. Or conversely, you can focus on dynasty, which increases your personal power by allowing you to field more armies and allows you to annex imperial cities, putting them under your direct control, though this also costs political influence. 
You'll also start with a full Doomstack Imperial Army under your command, armed with uber-powerful Imperial units, and though you can use them to squash rebellions, it's nearly impossible to replenish their ranks after battle, as the cost of upkeeping them will cripple your economy. So in this campaign, you're going to have to make hard choices if you choose to play as the Emperor. Do you allow some factions to secede so you don't have to pay for them anymore? Do you instead tax them all to death? Or do you try and reform the government before it all falls apart around you? The victory conditions for the Han Emperor are straightforward. Murder those yellow-wearing SOBs post-haste. And since you're already the Emperor, you don't have to worry about climbing the ladder. But with emerging factions, internal struggles, and warlord defections, you'll find that an uphill battle. But if you take decisive action and a few gambles, it's actually possible to win the campaign in under 50 turns. Some have even managed it under 30, though it's high risk and reward, and I found myself in a campaign that got steadily harder as my empire crumbled around me. Historically, Emperor Ling fumbled the ball at this point, and that's exactly what happened. He watched helplessly as his empire crumbled around him, unable to change anything. And when a famine hit northern China at the same time, it was enough for many to feel that the emperor had lost the mandate of heaven, and the divine right to rule was no longer his. Thus, kicking off the Yellow Turban Rebellion that this DLC covers, which precedes the War of the Three Kingdoms. Though that's something that neither the Emperor nor the Zhong brothers would live to see, as all of them had died within a year of the Rebellion's start. But that's a deeper story for another time. The Mandate of Heaven DLC for Total War Three Kingdoms will be available on January 16th in the Year of the Metal Rat 2020. Thanks for watching, and look for a more detailed history on the Yellow Turban Rebellion to land on this channel soon.